Shut up and sit down. Hi and welcome to Control Alt Delete slash Church. This week we are uh, delighted to welcome Martin Fair. Martin, you have a new job. Um, so what is it? And <laughs> well, to be honest, I'm still working it out, Stuart. Um, I am ordinarily and have been for over 28 years the minister at St Andrew's Church in Arbroath, a place I know and love so well now. But as of uh, well, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I was installed as the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. Um, and yeah, before that, go back six months, I had a fairly good idea of what that was going to look like. Uh, but talk about control, all delete, <laughs> but <laughs> applies to the role of moderator. And um, well, to begin with, as everything was changing, that was quite disorientating. I have to say now, I'm the first moderator really probably in living memory who's essentially been handed a blank piece of paper and asked to go and do something with the role. And uh, and that appeals to me, it really does. Brilliant. That's uh, an exciting but slightly daunting um, situation, isn't it? So you've yeah. you've known you've been, you were going to be moderator for ages. You know, the, the process happens quite far in advance, doesn't it? It does. We've got a really interesting process. So on the day that our moderator is installed, within one hour, the committee has been elected to find his or her replacement, which is a great way of keeping people's feet in the ground. And then the, let me just call it recruitment process, for want of a better phrase, it kicks in really in the summer, uh, or summer before the year that it, it might come to pass. So uh, this year, uh, the interview stage took place in September, and that evening I got a phone call, and I'll, I'll tell you straight, uh, I fell over with surprise. I mean, genuinely was happy to allow my name to go forward to, for consideration after a, you know, a lot of prayerful thinking, but genuinely didn't think it would actually come to pass. So I got a phone call in September, it's you. And uh, so, yes, yeah, since September through to March, so make that six months, I had all of that time planning and preparing for what this year as moderator was going to look like. And then honestly, within the space of two weeks, everything came crumbling down around me. That's a great lesson in life. It really is about your plans and about your future, your futuristic uh, sort of state of mind. Hey, it's all provisional. <laughs> and we've learned that big time now. Absolutely. So where were you when lockdown happened? Because for most folk, um, you know, I was in my church. Um, yeah. Where were you? I was in Edinburgh, Stuart. Uh, the moderator has a, well, there is an official residence, as it were, for, for the moderator to allow him or her to be apart from uh, the demands of the local Paris situation. Now, I wasn't actually into that flat because clearly the, pre the current moderator then, Colin, was still there. So I was in a, a furlough flat in, gosh, the word furlough has come a lot more popular now because uh, I was in a furlough flat in Edinburgh um, but I only ended up being there about two and a half weeks before I came back because at that time it was becoming evident that um, lockdown was going to kick in big time whatever I had planned for moderator was not going to be happening at least for the short term so it made sense for me to come back and be with my family rather than isolated in a, a flat in, Ed in Edinburgh nice as Morningside was uh, it was good to come home yeah, so that that's an unusual situation then, because obviously for the moderators, as you said, is removed from their congregation if, yeah. if they're still in post yeah. um, for the year of their um, their office. Yes. So you you now find yourself back in the manse, yeah. in our broth, with a, a blank diary. So that you know, how how's that feeling for you? Because I would imagine it's odd being you know, having expected not to be there, to be back yeah. there in the middle yeah. of a crisis yeah. and not not really being the minister of our both St Andrews at the I, moment. It is a bit odd. I, and I think it's probably odd for my congregation too, because on the first Sunday of March, you know, I got a kind of farewell. We had a, a lunch, there was a cake and they're uh, not exactly balloons and streamers, but, you know, <laughs> it, it was one of those farewells, you know, they sent me out with, you know, with their blessing and then, uh, hello, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> but not quite. So at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to juggle both roles at the Stuart. And uh, if I'm brutally honest, I'm not sure how long I'll be able to do that. Um, 
I decided to come back and, and, and try that because it looked to me like the, the, di well, the diary of the moderator was empty. Yeah. So I'm thinking, look, I didn't sign up to be redundant and twiddling my thumbs. I can probably be more useful in our bro. So I, I, I come back to that. However, that was 10 weeks ago. And now that I'm actually into the role of moderator, now that we're really beginning to grasp the digital possibilities, I'm seeing that I'm going to be far from redundant. In fact, there is much for me to do. So it, there will come a point, probably sooner rather than later, that I'll extricate myself from the, you know, from any attempt at, at ministering in St Andrews and just go for the moderator role f uh, full time. And, and the time will come for that quite soon. However, let me just say this, you know, there are some upsides. Um, this last week I've had two funerals, for example. Now, no moderator normally has anything like that to deal with. You're completely relieved of all of your normal duties. And, and I can see the point in that. But you know, what it does mean is that as I'm thinking about things nationally, as I'm maybe sharing reflections and so on as moderator from a national perspective, I'm doing so with my feet absolutely rooted on the ground and in a parish in a community that is happening. Um, so do you see what I'm saying? You know, there yeah. may be some upsides to that. that yeah. And uh, you know, to give you another example, I mean, just on Tuesday of this week, um, I was uh, working away at food distribution. Um, I mean, I personally get involved in that kind of thing because I, I think, again, it's good for ministers just to be, at least at some points, at the sharp end. Yeah. So there's the moderator of the assembly, you know, just getting amongst vulnerable families, supporting and assisting. And I, th I think that's really good in one way to help me to be seeing things through a local lens though trying to address things nationally. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think it's, it, you know, it's always been the criticism of uh, people who teach in any kind of way, isn't it? That, you, yeah. you know, as soon as you, uh, as soon as you get good enough to teach other people how to do it, you're removed from the situation that you found analogy. yourself in in the first place. Um, so, yeah, I th it makes perfect sense that, that yep. you know, when you phone somebody up or you speak to them like this, you can, you know, you're having a conversation about what you're both doing. You're not yes. having a, 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 you know, so it's not a philosophical conversation for you. It's, no. a, it's a real conversation. Yeah, it absolutely is. And uh, um, let me just tell you a bit about one of those funerals <clears throat> I referred to. It was uh, just one of the dearest guys in our congregation, a, a, an elder, and uh, someone who, well, respect absolutely, but someone who was absolutely loved, just, just one of the nicest human beings you would ever meet. And what an inspiration as a Christian man. So to have that funeral yesterday and not to be able to do it in the normal ways, I know absolutely that ministers, congregations across the nation and, and further afield are dealing with that, struggling with that at the moment. And uh, many, many folks from the church lined the route yesterday from uh, the person's house. And I think it was actually, Stuart, you were kind of key to that. Um, trying to almost revive that practice of yes. just stopping when a cortege would go past. Um, and I can remember that. I remember that, you know, the first funeral I can remember was my grandpa's and there was men at the side of the street that would take their caps off, they would yeah. stand in respect. And that's gone. I mean, in recent times, uh, none of that. So to see some of that back again, oh, it was moving, touching. This is what we mean when we talk about communities, isn't it? Absolutely. I had exactly the same experience yesterday. I had a, a funeral and the guy lived just around the corner from me, so I yeah. just drove out and joined the cortege, but the, the the whole of the estate had people standing out, and we drove through yeah. the village and people stopped, and it, it really does make such a difference to, to the family because they feel so disconnected at, at this time, you know, and, and you yeah. go to the funeral and there's a handful of people, and, and it, you know, you know that it wouldn't have been that. It would have been a church no. full of people. Uh, and, and that's really difficult for folk, but to see people making the effort, you know, even just to, to turn around and, and bow their head makes makes a massive difference to people. I think, I think it does. Uh, I wonder, Stuart, if you've any thoughts on this, but what I'm hearing from lots of ministers, and I've said it myself, to families that are grieving in those lockdown circumstances, therefore a funeral that might have had 300 people there has got, got 12, this kind of thing. 
and everybody's saying, uh, or what I'm hearing people saying is, but once you know, once lockdown's over, we'll be able to have a you know a service of Thanksgiving of, of some kind. And um, while I absolutely see the the possibility of that, and begin to think, gosh, are we building up for ourselves this huge workload? And, and I mean that's putting it as basic terms, but you know, are we, are we literally going to have one after another? day after day of, of Thanksgiving services. Um, and so two things come to mind about that. One, might it be that we want to do those things collectively as communities together rather than individual? And the second thing from a pastoral point of view, it might be some time till anything like that is possible. And will there be families who actually don't want to open those things up again? You yeah. know, they feel actually we've moved on We've done what we have to do by way of the grieving process, and we're happy with that. And I wouldn't want there to be pressure on people to feel that they have to have an aftermath lockdown uh, Thanksgiving service. Does that chime with you? It, it absolutely does. And the, the conversation about um, a memorial service tends to happen before the funeral, in my experience. Yeah. My experience. Yeah. Um, and after the funeral, it, it seems much less important. And I yeah. you know, hear things like, well, that wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be. <laughs> well, there's high praise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that. they mean that in terms of, um, you know, we, we didn't expect it to be as full or as significant or, you know, the, the kinds of things that they were dreading because there's only yeah. a small number of sure. people. No, um, I, I, it wouldn't I mean as much too. or it wouldn't be as dignified or, you know, I don't know. There's probably a whole load of things, but most of it's about the unknown, isn't it? That we just yeah. don't know what this is going to look like. Yeah. We know it's not going to be what we wanted or expected. But afterwards, folk have, and a number of people have said, um, I'm actually quite glad in some respects that it was just the family because we didn't have to do all of the stuff that goes around that sometimes people are really uncomfortable with or you, know, you need to speak to people when you don't feel like speaking to anybody and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that so yeah, there's you know while it's not probably as satisfactory in some senses, in other ways it it, it maybe is. And I think you're right. I, I think um, by the time we get to the the point where we're allowed mm -hmm. to have a large gathering of all the community, it might be that that that's what we do. We have a gathering of all the community and we we give thanks for everyone yeah. and celebrate their lives and 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 do that together. And I think yeah. that might be a much more powerful thing to do um, I think for so. the community think as well as for yeah. those who are grieving. Yeah, I, th I think quite possibly. And, and you're right, I've noticed that as well. People have come to funerals in these situations not knowing what to expect. And I've actually found it to be beautifully personal yeah. and intimate. And uh, without the strain and stress, you know, necessarily of lineups, you know, shaking yeah. hands with countless people, many of whom they might not even know, you know, put yeah. yourself into those normal circumstances because it yeah. could be work colleagues or people that, that, that are not in their immediate remit. And that is a stress and strain. So there are things that um, probably working quite well. I, I know exactly what you meant by somebody saying it wasn't as bad as thought it might be. I'm going to hang on to that wee phrase because it's giving me a picture of somebody showing up at church on a Sunday morning who's never been to church before and they leave after and say, Minister, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> that would be high praise, wouldn't it? I'd much rather have that than nice hymns. <laughs> nice hymns, yeah. <laughs> We've all been damned by that faint praise. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And sometimes it's true. Sometimes the hymns are nice. Um, <laughs> so that that that's a part of um, your role now that uh, is different. You know, I, I yeah. was I was mocking you slightly on Facebook yesterday um, because you've you've offered <laughs> a, a service for this week yes. um, for for the whole of the the Church of Scotland, which has been hugely appreciated. But at the same point, um, you don't have worship to prepare for. A congregation every week and um, yeah. so is, is that something that um it's obviously different but is it something you think you're going to miss um and, yeah. and how do you you know what what are your expectations around about that because colin uh, set himself into a, a kind of a, a daily yeah. reflection um you know which is a, a huge commitment to make yeah um, so what, what are you thinking in terms of uh, worship and your contribution to that yeah do you know i want to actually Absolutely, take my hat off to Colin, uh, you know, and Ruth. I mean, they, you know, obviously operated as a very a clear team 
And I think they offered us exactly what was needed at that point in time. If you look at the social media uh, response to those daily reflections, we're talking some 10, 11,000 you know, people yeah. viewed those reflections. So clearly there was a need and clearly they were able to answer that. But you move through seasons and I think what was pertinent then becomes somewhat less so as you go on. Different things become uh, important. So I tried to be quite clear from the beginning that I was not going to attempt that. I wasn't going to set myself up with, you know, something that would two weeks in would become really difficult. So I'm not going to do that. Um, neither, Stuart, do I have an exact plan of what it's going to look like. Uh, I'm stepping out at the moment. I'm finding my way into it. But you started by asking how, you know, am I going to miss leading worship and so on? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I love so much of what parish ministry is all about, and, and that is essentially who I am. Um, you know, this year of service to the National Church, I'm humbled to have been given the opportunity and you're very humbled that colleagues would think that you're worthy of it. But when all's said and done, I'll be going back to being a parish minister. That's my calling. And as part of parish ministry, um, I think if you were really to uh, hold me to answer it, I would say this, my favourite part of that is leading worship. Um, whether that be our Sunday morning offering or our Wednesday and so on, but I, I love the leading of worship. And even within that, I love the preaching exercise. So yeah, I'll find ways to continue that, of course, um, but missing the week to week with a family of God's people working through some themes and things with them. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to miss that for sure. And, and you mentioned the, you know, this, the National Service of Pentecost that put together. Uh, I've really, really enjoyed being part of that. It's not, I mean, it's not just been a case of, well, I'll do a service. It really is an act of collaboration. And uh, I really hope it's well received that, you know, it really tries to reflect uh, the church you know, across Scotland at this time. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a brilliant idea. Um, I think it, it, it was also timely. You talked about seasons that I think we, we've come to, you know, it's Pentecost and, uh, you know, if, if it's a perfect opportunity for the church to get together mm -hmm. uh, and to share in a, a kind of collective uh, act of worship, which is, yeah. it's just perfect. You know, that the, there are times uh, when things come and you just think, oh, well, that's obviously that's what's going to happen. You know, sure. well, why wouldn't you do that? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's come at a point where I think people are ready for it too. You know, it's not just that uh, it, it's Pentecost, you know, so no. we'll do this. It's, it's Pentecost, no. we're 10, 11 weeks into lockdown. Yeah. Wouldn't yeah. it be great if we could all get together? Yeah, and, and I, I, I mean, I think it's exactly that. And I've been really pleased. And, and again, I'll use the word humbled, and I, I genuinely mean it that way, to see ministers are sending me messages or just posting things like, ah, oh, I've been able to actually rest a little more this week because I've not got worship to prepare. So if it if it simply functions in that way to give people a break, then I'm delighted that, you know, and I'll say job done. But as you were saying there, I think, I hope it will be more than that, that there really will be a sense of togetherness and purposefulness about it. Um, but, I, but let me go back to this. I mean, I'm a parish minister and my understand, my ecclesiology, roots the church in the local. They can't have denominations if you don't have local churches. So for me, the purest or, you know, the nearest thing to an expression of what church is, is a group of local people. So worship should come in and be rooted in local expressions. So this Pentecost service is not for, by any way, to sort of somehow downgrade that, and it's a kind of one-off. Um, that said, I think the only other thing that I may be thinking about to come back to the idea of just giving people a break is that I might produce a couple of services that would be quite generic and not in any sense that everybody would stop and watch them, but just to make them available to ministers for July and August. So that again, ministers might be able to say, great, I can, you know, listen, we might not, not be able to go to Tenerife but we might still be trying to get a week off and please God, ministers are trying to get a break you know, in times of holiday and all of this. So if that would be the case, then there'd be a service they could go to. So they, 
churches could just pick it up and use it. Not a big national viewing, just something that I would make available to churches to use in their situation as it suited them. So that's kind of in my head at the moment. That's brilliant. And, and a, a really um, creative response to a problem, I think, that we all feel at the moment. You know, we've, we've, um, I spoke to, to Shuna Dix uh, a couple mm. of weeks ago, and, and Shuna had had a week off. And yeah. uh, she, she spent the, the week at home, but while everyone else around her was working. Um, yeah. So that was a really odd experience for her. Yeah. And I've had colleagues who've taken a week off and by you know two days in, they were bored out of their head because they, they couldn't go anywhere and, and do anything. But we still need to have time off. We do. And, and one of the worries of that is, well, you know, if I'm the person that's creating all of this stuff, mm. how do I do that? How do I get time off without having to do twice as much the week before? Yeah. And, you know, so that's a, a fabulous gift um, to be able to give to, to the church. Well, well, certainly that's the plan. And, uh, you know, this business about trying to get a week's holiday, gosh, you need such discipline, particularly if you use your phone for all of life, um, because, you know, you're using it personally. But unless you've got a, 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 a twin track system going on, then your email pops in and uh, the discipline required just to shut that off, maybe take, take out your notifications for a week. But unless we do, there is no escaping from it. And uh, I have to say, one maybe one of my roles as moderator is coming as a concern for you know concern for ministers more widely just than ministers but being a minister myself a particular affinity with ministers and then um, you know I want to, to try if I can to let ministers know you know know of that support that's there uh, even if it's just me and um, one thing that I'm started out on <laughs> talk about setting myself a challenge I really am going to try and contact every single minister on the phone and just talking and I have started and um, and it, it really is phoning up saying hello first of all people are what oh, the moderator's phoning me but then I'm saying to them how are you doing and they say well do you want to talk about church I was like, no how are you doing literally how are you doing and um, and I've you know and then I'm praying with people and uh, you see here's the thing in a normal moderator year the moderator's so caught up with engagements, visiting here, there, and everywhere, it would be inconceivable that they could start to literally phone their colleagues in, in ministry. But there's an opportunity. Uh, I've started out. I hope I can uh, manage it and get to the end of it. Because, I, I, yeah, for no, no other reason, I'm really enjoying speaking to my colleagues. Lots of folk I've never met, never had conversations with, but we've got one thing in common. You start talking, and it goes really good. And I'm aware that some ministers uh, are thriving in the present circumstances and some are really struggling. And I'm trying to be ears, you know, just to sense how people are and where people are at. That's brilliant. And I'm sure will be hugely appreciated, if not surprising. For folk. <laughs> Maybe both. Because part of, part, of, uh, part of your year would have been to visit a couple of presbyteries and yeah. to you know, go overseas and to represent the church in all different kinds of ways. Um, and so you get to see, I suppose, in the presbytery visit, you get to see a, a kind of a, a snapshot of, of sure. those two presbyteries and you would get to meet people. But as you said, and, a, a, you know, that's a, a, a quick visit, a dinner, a, you know, it's a, a snatched conversation that's never really the same kind of quality of conversation that you'll be able to have with people on the phone. Yeah, it definitely gets more personal. And, you know, I'm just thinking about even some of the people I phoned yesterday who, who really opened up, you know, very honestly about, about their situation. That's not going to happen in a church hall with a dainty, with a cup of tea and a dainty sandwich. Uh, I, I mean, I suspect most of that would be small talk. Yeah. Um, but getting to talk to people on the phone in this way, um, yeah, it's going to be a challenge because... That's a lot of people, um, but um, I think it is possible, and uh, I think it will be profitable. If, if only for me, it would be profitable because I'm hearing, I'm hearing, and uh, yeah, I know it's an old cliche, Stuart, but we're given one mouth and, and two ears, and uh, so you know, in my role as moderator, I want to listen to where the church is at. One of the, you know, one of the things we've been forced into is creative responses. You know, so your installation was a creative response to to where we found ourselves, and I, I you know, I found found a, a, a deeply moving service. 
you know, to 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 see the 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 firstly that it happened at all, you know, yeah. that they were able to put it together in in such a such a kind of short space of time. Um, but it didn't. It was a bit like the response to uh, to the funeral. You know, it wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. And yeah. actually, it it was in some ways much more moving um, than normal because it, it it's an exception. And and the 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 creativity and the um, so I suppose the the kind of the compassion that that was in it. Um, it was just amazing to see, you know. The, the really interested to hear you saying that because it, 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 it chimes with how I experienced it. I, I if, if, you know, my worst fears there were that it was going to be a complete non event. You know, that hall as well as I do, Stuart. And uh, you could pack a thousand people in there if you, you know, if you go for it. And you know, the thought of being in an empty hall with half a dozen people plus some tech. I thought, what is this? What is this going to feel like? Um, so, you know, we we showed up in the day, and honestly, from the moment I walked in, and I really want to pay tribute to to the folks like Michael Mayer. Uh, you know, Michael heads up our assembly arrangements, and uh, Michael gave everything of himself to that service to make it special and to make it work. And uh, I'm really grateful to Michael and to many others. And then the tech people, uh, I mean, I probably shouldn't start naming names because I'll forget some, but the whole bunch of people who made that happen. And it became, for, for me and for the family, a really very special experience. Um, I felt undoubtedly the presence of God right there. And also, though they weren't there, I felt myself surrounded by God's people. Um, I mean, I knew, yeah, people are joining online, but I'm, I, it's hard to describe. I sensed them right there with me. So it was very, very special. And when Colin invited me to kneel, you know, literally to be installed, you know, with that prayer, when one of our more senior moderators, the very reverend Jimmy Simpson, came on and spoke a word to me. I don't know how I spoke after that. It was so moving. I, I, I was really breaking up, you know, with the, uh, with the emotion of it. And uh, and as you've said, I think other people, well, some people at least experienced in that way as well. It, somebody wrote me a lovely letter and, you know, and said that they'd been at 22 General Assemblies and this installation had spoken to them more than any of the other ones before. And the point they were making was that although this person, you know, loves the Assembly, they were re recognising that a lot of the pageantry, I mean, for goodness sake, we've got... We've got regiments of trumpeters on the steps, you know, dressed in medieval costumes. We've got all of the pageantry, all of the stuff that's associated with it. And strip that away, strip that away, and you're left with something very simple, but very special. And, um, you know, I think in all years to come, I'll look back and say, do you know what? I'm quite thankful it actually was like that. It was really special. That's not to say that other moderators have not experienced it special in their way, but yeah, how it was for me, I don't regret it. It was really special. And we're all we're all called to serve in our time and in our way. Yeah. And you know, to you know, as you said, to have your your plans ripped up yeah. a couple of weeks before and to be presented with, well, Martin, you are our moderator, and this is the situation, and and you know, it doesn't matter. What that situation is, that you know, you've been called to this role for this year, and you know, the, I think the in some ways the, the that installation um, would was much more appropriate than it would have been to have a general assembly and then for this to happen six months or six weeks later. I agree, you know, and it, it kind of it, it spoke to the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I think it did. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to just take that on a little bit, Stuart. Um, you know, when it was first becoming clear that it wasn't going to happen as ordinarily, absolutely, I was you know, hit with initial disappointment. Um, but I'm past that, that's for sure. But in the earlier conversations, or you're thinking about it, no assembly, really nothing to do after that. I mean, I actually voiced in some conversations with people within the church, what do you think about, could the church actually just ha not have a moderator this year? 
and such things that might crop up, well, we could use, we've got a team of former moderators who could step up and fill cert certain situations. And, and that really was a possibility in my mind back then when it first became clear. But folks, I think wiser and more, you know, who were thinking further ahead than me at that point said, no, we're going to need a moderator this year as never before. So I was persuaded by that. And now that I'm here, you know, the better part of a fortnight or whatever it is in, I'm beginning to see that that, that is going to be a role for me. And uh, it's exciting and, um, you know, big sense of responsibility as well. Yeah. Um, and so, so many people have sent messages you know, praying for you at this time, our congregations praying for you. Without that, Stuart, I, gosh, I, you know, I, I really would feel like um, out on a limb. Um, but I'm, I'm feeling myself massively supported, and that's a lovely place to be. Brilliant. One of the, the things that would have happened at General Assembly is we would have had another conversation about radical reform, because that's <laughs> what we do every year at the General Assembly. We've, we've been having that conversation forever, We're it comfortable seems. comfortable with talking about radical reform. Yeah, we are, very, very. And uh, all of a sudden it's happened. Yeah. You know, that, that all of those, you know, like your plans, all of those plans have been torn yeah. up thrown out the window and here we are you know church is massively different in some ways than it was 12 weeks ago um so how do you how do you see that going forward that you know we've, we've can i got to a place probably now where um those those congregations that have a uh, kind of made the move to online yeah. uh, worship in whatever format that's taken are getting reasonably comfortable with it now it's becoming less of a a kind of terrifying prospect to have to sit and talk to your phone once a week and then to <laughs> wonder if it's going to upload to whatever platform uh, you're using we're, we're kind of settling into that a wee bit yeah. so what what do you think in terms of you've you've mentioned that you know that there are possibilities for your your year but also for the church so how do you see all that kind of playing out what are the things that have been you know good about yeah. what have happened yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, just a word about a bit of radical plan, you know, how you introduced this question. Um, yeah, we'll, we've talked about it, talked about it, and, and, and not just in the last couple of years. I mean, you go back to maybe the church without walls and, and folks with longer memories than me will tell you about plans. But with any big institution and probably the, the older the institution, the more so, it's extremely difficult, extremely difficult to turn that around. And um, I mean, I've heard people right at the centre of the institution crying out to, we want, we want to change too. And yet somehow an inertia kicks in. Now, you've got to be really careful how you handle the theology there, because I, for one, will not be saying any time soon or at all that God has visited COVID on us to achieve something in the church. Um, that's not my God, you know. However... I think what God is able to do is out of any situation to bring good stuff. And uh, so if I can put it somewhat colloquially or lightheartedly, I maybe think that, that God's kind of said, OK, guys, <laughs> I give you every opportunity to get your house in order and give yourself a good shakeover and a spring clean. You aren't getting there any, any time soon. So how about you get on with it now? Now, that's to put it in quite light-hearted tones, but maybe, it, you know, that is the effect of it. Uh, and we are discovering all kinds of new possibilities. I embrace that wholeheartedly. I think, Stuart, at the same time, I would want to say that I am a little concerned, worried, fearful that as human beings, our natural default is often to go back. And so, yeah, we're experimenting right now. We're doing all that kind of stuff. But let's say, I mean, for argument's sake, it wouldn't happen. But let's say for argument's sake that you know, it was announced, you can go back to church next Sunday, uh, no restrictions, everybody can gather again. Boy, we'd be right there. We'd probably be right there. Um, like um, it's been announced that McDonald's drive throughs are open again. Well, I've been getting on perfectly well without my Big Macs. Thank you very much. But you watch, you know, the queues for those drive throughs we, you know, we've got this instinct to go back. Now, I think what we're going to look at probably more profitably as we go forward is a kind of twin track, a, a, a twin track approach. I heard it put yesterday by another minister that we're going to probably have to pursue analog church 
and digital church. I think that's right. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, and I haven't heard them be proposing, great, we're doing it digital now. We never have to go back in a church building. I don't think that's, you know, that's reasonable or realistic. But if going back to the church building meant that we weren't going to do the digital anymore, that would be a travesty, it really would. And even within that, I'd want to say that I think the church is going to have to be really creative about what it does, because I know that what I would do on a Sunday morning, the content of that, the style of that, I honestly think that cuts it out there in the world. So when I say twin track, I think for my own self, I think I'm going to be, I'd be looking at, yeah, getting church services in the traditional sense back up and running again, but also producing content to engage online with younger people, with people who are not going to walk through the doors of the church. So I think it's both and. That's got all sorts of implications for prioritising, for ministry time and stuff like that. We need to work that out. Yeah, and and some of that's still so unknown, isn't it? That we, yeah. but I think we've all realised that um, this digital thing, it works. You know, the yeah. one, I, I, I was uh, loving that one of your first responses to everybody being locked in the house was to try and bring us all together in community through a quiz, yeah, quiz um, yeah. which was just great. You know, yeah. and it, it, you, you, when you started that, you must have had absolutely no idea if anybody would tune into that. It could have been just you yeah. sitting sitting there reading questions to, to nobody or to three people or yeah, to 300 devices. <laughs> Even that I would have enjoyed. I love quizzes yeah. so much, even though I was yeah. answering one question. But yeah, <laughs> you're right. Absolutely took off. And and uh, I mean, in the end, you know, like thousands of people took part in that quiz the world over. And look, in similar kind of ways, when I, when I think I first had my first Zoom meeting or Teams meeting or whatever it was, or even trying to do something in Facebook Messenger, I was going into that thinking like, oh, well, I suppose this is the only way it's going to work, you know, we'll just have to do that. But now that we're familiar with the environment and with the way it works, it's brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. Now, for somebody that was quite committed and involved with the workings of the National Church, ordinarily, I was in Edinburgh minimum once or twice a week. So that's th three to four hours of travel time, you know, every occasion. Not to mention the expense, better part of fifty pounds, you know, return rail ticket or bro to Edinburgh, mm. and not to mention the environmental impact of all that travelling. So, yeah, there's loads of ways that we're discovering right now. And again, I want to say, I'm not suggesting we never meet again <laughs> face to face. I mean, we, of course we do. We're humans. We need to be together. But there are lots of tools and you know things available to us now that we must maximise as we go forward. So what do you see? Some of that's incredibly exciting. You know, we've, we've all noticed that we've been engaging with people who haven't really engaged with Sunday morning services and all that kind of stuff. But also, obviously, raises some issues, doesn't it? That um, to, to watch a 20-minute video on Facebook isn't the same level of no. engagement or commitment as getting up on a Sunday and, and going to be with a group of people physically. So, yeah. and then there, there's all kinds of questions around about, well, how, how do you disciple people online? Yeah. How do they how do they learn more? Or do they only ever kind of tune in on a Sunday and, and, and that's enough? And, you know, the, re the reality of that is that we have no idea whether that's what the people who are sitting in front of us on a Sunday are doing too. Right. You know, they might be tuned in for, for some of what's happening, but they might not, you know, so... So is there a difference? Are, are we going to see a, 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 a plethora of new uh, digital discipleship tools? And, you know, what, what do you think that looks like? I'd love to think so, because you, I, you, I think you're absolutely right. 20-minute um, views on, on Facebook goes so far, but not far enough. Even then, probably a word of caution. I don't know, if, Stuart, if you've ever looked at some of the Facebook analytics, but it's absolutely scary. Um, you know, you might start off with so many viewers, but you look at, you know, at, at the stats about how many are, are there for the whole of the, whole of that duration, and it's actually not as many as you would like it to be. Uh, but again, maybe it was the same in church when you started preaching, everybody was there, and by the end of the sermon, you have 10% following. I'm, I'm just making the point that the way that the web works, and, and particularly YouTube and such things, people fly from one to another, they really do. 
and um, they will dip in for a short part of you know of your offering and not necessarily co to commit to it all. So, is that kind of engagement going to lead to discipleship? Is it going to lead to followers of Christ? Then, wow, one would have to be somewhat skeptical about that. And um, let me trail something that's coming up quite soon on the eighth of eighth of June, um, Sanctuary First. Now you'll know big online presence. They've been really pioneering, uh, you know, in, in Scotland and in that way for some time. They're holding a, a sort of webinar conference on the 8th of January. It really is going to be thinking about those questions you've picked up. How do we, how do we go further? How do we really begin to engage with people beyond them just watching? And th that is the next stage. It absolutely is. Um, I don't come here today with a bunch of answers to that, but I absolutely know those are the questions we need to be asking. That's that's often the best place to start, isn't it? You know, yeah. working out what the right question is. Okay. I think you say, you know, that, that you talked about the uh, about leading worship every week. For me, that's one of the things I love about it is, is yeah. spending time wondering what what's the right question sure. about this. You know, and if we can get to that, then that leads us into a whole rich seam of conversation and exploration together and growth yeah. together. And yeah. and you know, Stuart, in that. That shouldn't please not that that be ministers and worship leaders um, dreaming up dreaming up the questions. <laughs> Gotta ask people well, yeah. what are your questions genuinely. I remember in a, a worship service um, we do a Wednesday service ordinarily. We've done it for twenty years actually, and uh, it's, it's a smaller gathering. It's more informal, it's more engagement. And uh, in one of those Wednesday services, I remember actually saying to people, "So, what's the stuff you worry about in life?" Not presuming that I would know the answer, but just asking them that. And they all wrote stuff down. And the three things that emerged, if I remember right, were family, health, money. But, you know, in that kind of order, most people touched on that. We worry about our family, you know, that our family's going to be okay. Health for ourselves, for other people, money, you know, are we managing? Um, what's my pension going to look like? So those were the kind of things. And I listened to that and thought, well, the gospel needs to address those, you know, those things that are, are real for people. So let's not have ministers in their studies when, and, you know, with rows of books behind them, we've talked a lot about that, you know, sort of coming up with answers to, to questions that are not even being asked. So in this online digital world, we must be engaging with people in two-way conversations and not think that just putting out endless monologues is going to cut it. Is going to cut it. Yeah, and that... That involves learning a new kind of dialogue, doesn't it? So that that's not just about me posting content. That's about me paying attention to to what people are saying about that and and encouraging that yeah. conversation alongside it. Yeah. Um, I've I've got you can see a whiteboard up there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've occasionally write things on it, and uh, one of the things I, I that was up there for ages is you know how do you drive engagement? It's not you know you know I can you know I can post content twice a day, every day, forever. Yeah. And it is completely pointless if it doesn't drive engagement. Correct. You know, so how how do you how do you how do you do that? How do you engage somebody you've never met before, yeah. potentially, in a conversation? And at the same time, minister to people that live next door and, yeah. and up the street that you do know. Um and it's a it's yeah. a tricky kind of balancing act, isn't it? Absolutely. Let me offer a couple of things into that which are not necessarily restricted to the, the kind of digital world we're in, but which could apply forever. Um, first of all, to say that uh, I chatted to a minister not that long ago, a fairly new minister, and listen, see, see those of us who have been in ministry roles for a longer time, we have got to continually get ourselves a long time new, alongside newer ministers uh, to be learning from them. And, you know, I'm committed to that. Anyway, this reasonably new minister was telling me that what he is doing is he goes with his draft of his sermon into a coffee shop, right? And he just, he actually goes up and sits beside a complete random and first of all invites himself, you know, would you mind? <laughs> He's got a few manners about him, but but then, you know, assuming that's allowed, he actually then goes on to say, by the way, I'm a minister and um, I'm working on a sermon for Sunday. And would you do me an enormous favour favor and actually read it? Yeah. So, so he actually hands over a, a manuscript of his sermon. 
the minute, you know, this random in the, in the cafe, well, well, okay, reads it through. And then the minister says, so what do you think about it? And then they have a conversation. Now, this is largely, largely speaking, going to be a person that probably doesn't do church or anywhere near that. But he then redrafts his sermon based on that conversation. Stuart, I think that's absolutely brilliant. I really that's do. Incredible. I love that idea. Yeah. Um, there's another uh, idea which I've read about and worked with a little bit, but never took it to its full possibility. And it's a more internal church thing than that than what I've just described. But I still think there's merit in it. There's a book and it's called The Round Table Pulpit. And what this book espouses is that the minister sits with like a focus group, if you want to use that terminology, members of the church, although, you know, you could broaden that out, sits with them on the Monday of the week and they look together at the Bible passages that are going to be relevant that coming Sunday. They just, they just throw it around together. Uh, the minister listens to what people are saying, listens to the questions that are being raised by the people. Then the sermon is composed. And I love that way of thinking as well. That therefore the sermon is more a dialogue coming out of what people are actually saying and doing. Um, I don't think we're doing nearly enough of that kind of stuff. I uh, we do a little bit of that. We have morning prayers on a, a Tuesday and a Thursday, and okay. on the Tuesday we look at the Old Testament reading for the Sunday oh, coming, and on the Thursday we look at the the gospel. Is um, that something you're doing now digitally, or yeah, you were doing yeah, anyway? Yeah, both. Um, yeah. We did we did do it, and we but now would we, we do it in Zoom. Um, wow. And it's fascinating because by the time I get to Thursday, I've been thinking about, obviously, yeah. what I might say, but I, I tend not to have written yeah. by then. Uh, I like the pressure of a deadline. Yeah. Uh, but it's <laughs> but it's amazing how often what I'm thinking changes completely because of that conversation. Yeah. Um, it's brilliant. I, I, I love that. And, and one of the first things I said when I when I came here, so I've been here pretty much three years, um, today or tomorrow, I think, is the, the yeah. kind of anniversary yeah. of, of coming. Yeah. Um, so my first cup session meeting, I said, look, I want feedback on my, my, my preaching. You know, I want to know what you think. And I don't, I don't mean coming up and saying, oh, that was really nice, Stuart, thanks. I, I want to know what, what you think. And there's this kind of, you know, astonishment that, <laughs> you, what, do you, what do you mean? You know, and, and you think, well, how, how on earth, you know, I, 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 um, my background, is, as you know, one of the first times we met was when I, I came to your church as a... Yeah. a must have been about 12, um, to, to talk about youth work. And so my, my kind of culture has been in that sort of reflective practice, um, yeah. evaluative stuff, uh, evidence-based practice kind of kind of thing. And then you go into ministry and you ask people, well, what do you think of what's just happened? And yeah. you know, they, they don't have either the tools or the language sometimes or the, or the practice. No. I, I've been able to reflect on that. So, mm. so it's really difficult sometimes to, to create a conversation that, that's helpful for me in that kind of uh, 360 kind of thing where, and they're getting much better at it. You know, that I think they, they, once they realized I was, I wasn't kidding <laughs> um, that, that, you know, people have started to really engage with that and, and it's been brilliant. Um, yeah. But, it, but it was hard work at the start to get people to be, you know, to honestly say, well, you know, I'm not sure about what you were saying there or how you were saying it. You know, yeah. people, people weren't uh, comfortable criticizing the the guy no. in the pulpit no I, I mean it's much more work um far easier i mean listen i could rattle out services any day of the week yeah. but to do it in an engaging manner and um, somehow sensing dialogue uh, it's definitely much harder um but there's also the theology going on here in terms of the you know understanding what preaching is and there might be those who who really see themselves to coin a phrase six feet above contradiction you know um, I'm anointed for this. I'm appointed for this. God dispenses uh, to me, and I'm sort of almost a priestly function. Almost, you know, I am the conduit through which this word will come to you. Um, and the six feet of contradiction being, you know, maybe up in the pulpit and so on. Um, for my own part, my understanding of the preacher is one of the people, and really this does borrow from Calvin, who is one of the people who is asked for that moment to step up, but remains one of the people. Um, and gosh, clericalism has, has done terrible things to the church. And you know, if we could recover a sense of the minister having a gift in one or other direction, but not in a sense that he or she was therefore more important or et cetera, et cetera, it would be far healthier. 
and just what you've described, you know, I love that, you know, the Tuesday on the Old Testament passage, the Thursday on the New Testament, just chatting that around with people. You'll benefit. Everybody will benefit from the preaching. And, uh, you know, a win-win. What's not to like? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, what does next week look like? Then you said you had nothing in your diary, so you've got no trips planned, I guess, unless they're still penciled in for early next year. Um, you had, yeah. you didn't have the the joy of chairing a week long meeting. Yeah. Um, so what what does the, the the kind of coming weeks? What do what do they look like? What are the kinds of things that that you've started to tentatively pencil in alongside phoning a thousand ministers? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm absolutely delighted to be doing stuff like this, Stuart, and uh, and and other things. I'm, I, I, I've done th- some things for radio, and so on, some podcasts, and yes, uh, convening, moderating meetings, and things like that. But by way of being somewhat more proactive, um, I've got a couple of things in mind, and uh, you know, they're not firmed up as such, but I, I think I'm going to go down this road. Um, one thing I'm thinking about is calling it Monday night with a moderator, okay? And we'll put out something on Monday evenings. And what I'm looking at there is doing conversations with people almost like we're, you know, just like we're doing now. You know, it might be hosted on, on Zoom, or, Zoom or somewhere like that. And really my, my feeling is that th- there can be much more comes out of that than me just doing my thing. You know, I could... Every night of the week, if I wanted, just put something out in perils of wisdom from the moderator or something like that. But I think there's more to it than that, probably. And honestly, I don't have 365 perils of wisdom, so it would run out by the early summer. Um, So I'm thinking of uh, just getting in conversation with people, and that would be everything from um, Doug Gay, John Drain, you know, those theologians who who have an eye to mission, But it would also be about, for example, um, there's a guy I'm going to do this with who, you know, came through heroin addiction, you know, through some of our local ministries. So, yeah, I'm going to get into conversation with guys like that um, and just put that out there and see if people can engage with that. Um, Another couple of things I'm going to do is um, just by way of some kind of engagement that hopefully people can relate to. Um, and forgive the kind of cliched tabloid uh, type uh, titles, I, I may refine those, but I'm thinking about uh, moderator at the movies. Now, I love my movies, and I I never go to a movie, Stuart, without thinking, you know, without getting about 10 sermon illustrations. I mean, if you just watch movies, movies deal with life, and as a minister, I'm dealing with life. So I'm thinking through that little series to engage with particular movies, you know, get online interaction, talking about movies and see what lessons for life come out of those. You know, where's the spirituality in that? And my other one's going to be that I'm thinking about as a moderator on the Monroe's because there's my other big passion. And I never go into the mountains without that becoming more than a physical exercise, but a spiritual exercise. And, um, so I want to engage with people about that as well. How do we how do we um, be in the outdoors world where we find God in such moments? So I just dropped those couple of ideas in as I'm beginning to develop thoughts and plans about how I might engage digitally as we go forward. Brilliant. Those sound fabulous, actually. I'm, I'm liking that. And they're all M's as well. So you've got a whole well, alliteration thing going. Well, so that's... Well, that's what I mean. As I say, if I wasn't a minister, I'd be a headline writer for the sun. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the movie thing already. Um, I, yep. I share your passion, and I'm looking forward to hopefully you dressing up as characters from the movie <laughs> as you host that as you're having your quiz. Some folks will know what that's all about, and others are talking about. But anyway, it was, yeah, it was thinking, it was who is this guy? Yeah, all these <laughs> yeah. Cool. I think, but those, you know, those kind of speak to the things that we've been talking about. So there's a, you know, you you obviously have a. a a huge passion and concern for the church and so to to talk about talk to and about to people like you know Doug and John Drain and and people like that about where the church is and to make that a conversation that other people can access yeah that's is a hugely important thing but then to engage with cultural things like movies and mountains and you know yeah. to 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 give people a sense of this place which sure. I, I think is you know a, a, 
an amazing thing to be able to do. Um, yeah. Also to take, you know, it goes back to your, what are your questions? You know, people, movies address people's questions, don't they? They, yeah. they, they take an issue and they form a story around about it and, and yeah. present that in a way that we can then uh, resonate with yeah. uh, in some yeah. way. And to, to open that up is, you know, the same task as preaching in, in yes. many ways, isn't it? I think it is. And, um, but you know, my, my deep down hope, Stuart, is that in those kind of formats and with those kind of subjects and, you know, those kind of ways in, can we, can we break out beyond the church? Yeah. Now, I'm sure there are biblical metaphors that will come into play in all of that. But I just wonder if, if we just stick to it in a very traditional sense of, you know, like in youth group days, Everybody would have great fun, and then at the end there would be a little God slot. I mean, if I if I just turn out a bunch of God slots, I think a lot of people there'd be a bunch of people you would enjoy that. I'm not decrying that, but I've got a bigger vision, and um, I want, I'd love to engage you know further afield you know than the you know than the traditional audience if I can put it that way. And my hope is naively or otherwise that if we begin to talk about movies and stuff like that, using that as a platform then, you know, maybe a lot of folk begin to tune in and, and think, you know, actually, I quite like talking about spirituality, yeah. Um, and, you know, you talked about the church there, Stuart, and um, I think of a very fine balancing act. Um, I absolutely love the church, you know, that God has called me into, but at the same time, I'm not precious about it. And what I mean by that is that, you know, if there was no Church of Scotland as of the 31st of December this year, um, the kingdom, well, the kingdom goes on. So that's what I mean by saying I'm not precious about the church, but but it's here and I love it. I, I, I genuinely love the church. Um, and so everything that I'm about is for love of the church, but for the bigger goal, because I want to serve the kingdom. And uh, and that sort of goes way above church, doesn't it? And, you know, institutional sense of that. It really does. That seems like a, a perfect point to, to finish, Martin. Thanks Good. so much for your time. I realise that even though you've got nothing in your diary, your time is still incredibly precious. So I'm, I'm delighted that you chose to spend some time with us today. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And listen, Stuart, thank you for setting up this podcast. I mean, the minute I saw it, I thought, there we go again. Stuart Cutler's on to something. And uh, you've got that about you, Stuart. So keep it up for the good of the church and for the good of the kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.